Okay. Hello, everyone. This is going to be our meeting on digital logic today, and I'm going to get a little into it. So just a repetition, here's all of our social media, our Discord, our website, our Instagram, and YouTube. So if you're interested in any of those. And today you'll be seeing that we're on the digital logic uh, part of the week. And next week, we're going to be going over the first project. So that's going to be exciting. So you guys actually get some project experience. So I'll tell you guys a little later at the end what that project will entail so you can add it to your resumes if you want to. And we're going to get into it. So uh, the first thing with logic, like anything you'll ever see is zeros and ones. So what does this mean? Zero means off. So we have off for zero and we have on for one. What else can we indicate with a zero? That's a low state and a low means off and a one can also mean a high state, which is the same as on. So it's like a light switch. The zero would represent when the switch is off. So if I have my light switch here, the off portion would represent the zero and the on portion, if I flicked it up, that would represent one, so it would be on. And so that's what we mean by zeros and ones in binary. It just tells you if it's on or off. So one on, off, zero, pretty simple. And so now we're gonna talk a little about truth tables. And so truth tables help store these values of zeros and ones to keep them coordinated. And so I'm gonna get a little further into these later on, but just so you can see, we have inputs and then we'll have an output. And with these, you can see there's two inputs here and we got one output. Here we got two inputs and then we got one output. And then here we have uh, two inputs, then there should be a line right here. And then we got one output. So we can put in these values for zeros and ones as our inputs and get out outputs of zeros and ones as well. So we're gonna be going over that and you'll see how they work with logic gates. And so um, this diagram here, I included it just for visual representation. So for everyone who likes visuals, on the right here, you can see for one, it's on and for off, it's zero. So the LED turns on when you give it a high input. Okay. Now I'm going to get into the next slide. So we're going to be talking about logic gates. And so what a gate does is it takes these signals that come in and it produces an output. And so um, there's certain combinations of signals when they enter. And the most common gates you'll see are not and and or gates. And so uh, you guys will often encounter these. There's also NAND, NOR gates. Uh, that's just a NOT added to the AND gate and then a NOT added to the OR gate. So I'm going to show you a little visual of each. So a NOT gate is the first one. And you can see right here, it looks like a triangle. And then there's the circle at the end. So if I have a signal here, zero, it goes through. And this little bubble here, is what changes the output. So it flips the output from the input. So it's gonna change it to a one. And the similar thing would happen if we put a one in here, it's gonna flip the input and make a zero as the output. So not key just does exactly the opposite of what you input for its output. So you can see right here in the truth table for input, when we input zero, our output is gonna be one. When we input one, our output's gonna be zero. And so it just flips the input. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the AND gates. So AND gates, it requires two or more inputs to be true. It depends on the size of your AND gate. So it will require all the inputs to be true. That's what I remember. So these two inputs here must be one if we want an output of one. If there are any other value, let's say for instance, this one is zero, then it's gonna produce an output of zero. 
And same thing happens. If the other signal or input is zero, the output's going to be zero. And if both are zero, the output's going to be zero. So an AND gate, how it's special is the inputs must both be high in order for the output to be high. So that's the one condition. So you guys can see here, uh, if I go to the actual truth table, for my inputs, they must both be high. So that means they must both be one in order for the output to be high or one. If one of the inputs is zero, so it's at the low state, the output's gonna always be zero. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the OR gates. So OR gates, one input must be true. That's the condition. So here we have our OR gate and how I remember the two gates is look at the last letter of D for AND and look at this shape here. Doesn't it look like a D? And then for uh, the OR gate, it's just the half, how I think of it, sort of like a half circle. So it reminds me of the R shape, the top here, because it bends, but then it goes inwards a little. And so how I remember, just remember the AND gate ends in D. And so you need to draw a D for your shape. And the OR gate is just the little inside here. You have a little bend in it. So that's how I remember the shapes, so you know, for the gates. So for the OR gate here, one of the inputs must be one in order for the output to be one. So I could have zero, one here, and that will produce an output of one. I could have one, zero, and that will still produce an output of one. I could have one, one, and that will still produce an output of one. The only condition that will produce zero is if both are zero. And that's because not one of the outputs is one. So that makes it false because if um, one of the outputs is one, then the uh, one of the inputs is one, then the output will for sure be one. So we can look at our truth table here. And we just have the condition that at least one must be true in order for the output to be true. And so here we have this one input. So because that one input's true, the output's true. This one input's true, so the output's true. And this one, both the inputs are true, so the output is true. And so that's the one cool thing about an OR gate is it just depends on one input being true. And now that we talked about those simple logic gates, I'm gonna wanna get into a little more advanced functions you can do with them. So I'm gonna show you guys a little video. Um, I'll play it for a while and then I'll check back in with you guys. So I'm gonna turn up my volume real quick and I'm gonna let you guys watch it. Hi, I'm Carrie ann and welcome to Crash Course Computer Science. Today we start our journey up the ladder of abstraction where we leave behind the simplicity of being able to see every switch and gear, but gain the ability to assemble increasingly complex systems. <laughs> Last episode, we talked about how computers evolved from electromechanical devices that often had decimal representations of numbers, like those represented by teeth on a gear, to electronic computers with transistors that can turn the flow of electricity on or off. And fortunately, even with just two states of electricity, we can represent important information. We call this representation binary, which literally means of two states, in the same way a bicycle has two wheels or a biped has two legs. You might think two states isn't a lot to work with, and you'd be right, but it's exactly what you need for representing the values true and false. In computers, an on state when electricity is flowing represents true. The off state, no electricity flowing, represents false. We can also write binary as ones and zeros instead of trues and falses. They are just different expressions of the same signal. But we'll talk about that in the next episode. Now, it is actually possible to use transistors for more than just turning electrical current on and off and to allow for different levels of current. Some early electronic computers were ternary, that's three states, and even quinary using five states. The problem is the more intermediate states there are, the harder it is to keep them all separate. If your smartphone battery starts running low or there's electrical noise because someone's running a microwave nearby, the signals can get mixed up. 
And this problem only gets worse with transistors changing states millions of times per second. So placing two signals as far apart as possible using just on and off gives us the most distinct signal to minimize these issues. Another reason computers use binary is that an entire branch of mathematics already existed that dealt exclusively with true and false values. And it had figured out all the necessary rules and operations for manipulating them. It's called Boolean algebra. George Boole, from which Boolean algebra later got its name, was a self-taught English mathematician in the 1800s. He was interested in representing logical statements that went under, over, and beyond Aristotle's approach to logic, which was, unsurprisingly, grounded in philosophy. Boole's approach allowed truth to be systematically and formally proven through logic equations, which he introduced in his first book, The Mathematical Analysis of Logic, in 1847. In regular algebra, the type you probably learned in high school, the values of variables are numbers and operations on those numbers are things like addition and multiplication. But in Boolean algebra, the values of variables are true and false, and the operations are logical. There are three fundamental operations in Boolean algebra, a not, an and, and an or operation. And these operations turn out to be really useful, so we're going to look at them individually. A not takes a single Boolean value, either true or false, and negates it. It flips true to false and false to true. We can write out a little logic table that shows the original value under input and the outcome after applying the operation under output. Now here's the cool part. We can easily build Boolean logic out of transistors. As we discussed last episode, transistors are really just electrically controlled switches. They have three wires, two electrodes and one control wire. When you apply electricity to the control wire, it lets current flow through from one electrode through the transistor to the other electrode. This is a lot like a spigot on a pipe. Open the tap, water flows. Close the tap, water shuts off. You can think of the control wire as an input and the wire coming from the bottom electrode as the output. So with a single transistor, we have one input and one output. If we turn the input on, the output is also on because the current can flow through it. If we turn the input off, the output is also off and the current can no longer pass through. Or in Boolean terms, when the input is true, the output is true. And when the input is false, the output is also false which again, we can show on a logic table. This isn't a very exciting circuit though, because it's not doing anything. The input and output are the same, but we can modify this circuit just a little bit to create a knot. Instead of having the output wire at the end of the transistor, we can move it before. If we turn the input on, the transistor allows current to pass through it to the ground and the output wire won't receive that current, so it will be off. In our water metaphor, grounding would be like if all the water in your house was flowing out of a huge hose, so there wasn't any water pressure left for your shower. So in this case, if the input is on, output is off. When we turn off the transistor though, current is prevented from flowing down it to the ground. So instead, current flows through the output wire. So the input will be off and the output will be on. And this matches our logic table for not. So congrats, we just built a circuit that computes not. We call them not gates and we call them gates because they're controlling the path of our current. The AND Boolean operation takes two inputs but still has a single output. In this case, the output is only true if both inputs are true. Think about it like telling the truth. You're only being completely honest if you don't lie even a little. For example, let's take the statement, my name is Carrie Ann and I'm wearing a blue dress. Both of those facts are true, so the whole statement is true. But if I said my name is Carrie Ann and I'm wearing pants, that would be false because I'm not wearing pants or, or trousers if you're in England. The Carrie Ann part is true, but a true and a false is still false. If I were to reverse that statement, it would still obviously be false. And if I were to tell you two complete lies, that is also false. And again, we can write all of these combinations out in a table. To build an AND gate, we need two transistors connected together so we have our two inputs and one output. If we turn on just transistor A, current won't flow because the current is stopped by transistor B. Alternatively, if transistor B is on but transistor A is off, same thing, the current can't get through. Only if transistor A and transistor B are on does the output wire have current. The last Boolean operator is OR, where only only one input has to be true for the output to be true. For example, my name is Margaret Hamilton or I'm wearing a blue dress. This is a true statement because although I'm not Margaret Hamilton, unfortunately, I am wearing a blue dress. So the overall statement is true. An or statement is also true if both facts are true. The only time an OR statement is false is if both inputs are false. Building an OR gate from transistors needs a few extra wires. Instead of having two transistors in series, one after the other, we have them in parallel. We run wires from the current source to both transistors. We use this little arc to note that the wires jump over one another and aren't connected, even though they look like they cross. If both transistors are turned off, the current is prevented from flowing to the output, so the output is also off. Now, if we turn on just transistor A, current can flow to the output. 
Same thing if transistor A is off, but transistor B is on. Basically, if A or B is on, the output is also on. Also, if both transistors are on, the output is still on. OK, now we've got NOT and, and OR gates, and we can leave behind their constituent transistors and move up a layer of abstraction. The standard engineers use for these gates are a triangle with a dot for a NOT, a D for the AND, and a spaceship for the OR. Those aren't the official names, but that's how I like to think of them. Representing them and thinking about them this way allows us to build even bigger components while keeping the overall complexity relatively the same. Just remember that all of the mess of transistors and wires is still there. For example, another useful Boolean operation in computation is called an exclusive OR, or XOR for short. XOR is like a regular OR, but with one difference. If both inputs are true, the XOR is false. The only time an XOR is true is when one input is true and the other input is false. It's like when you go out to dinner and your meal comes with a side salad or a soup. Sadly, you can't have both. And building this from transistors is pretty confusing, but we can show how an XOR is created from our three basic Boolean gates. We know we have two inputs again, A and B, and one output. Let's start with an OR gate, since the logic table looks almost identical to an OR. There's only one problem. When A and B are true, the logic is different from OR, and we need to output false. To do this, we need to add some additional gates. If we add an AND gate and the input is true and true, the output will be true. This isn't what we want, but if we add a NOT immediately after, this will flip it to false. OK, now if we add a final AND gate and send it that value along with the output of our original OR gate, the AND will take in false AND and true. And since AND needs both values to be true, its output is false. That's the first row of our logic table. If we work through the remaining input combinations, we can see this Boolean logic circuit does implement an exclusive OR. And XOR turns out to be a very useful component, and we'll get to it in another episode. So useful, in fact, engineers gave it its own symbol too, an OR gate with a smile. But most importantly, we can now put XOR into our metaphorical toolbox and not have to worry about the individual logic gates that make it up or the transistors that make up those gates, or how electrons are flowing through a semiconductor, moving up another layer of abstraction. When computer engineers are designing processes, they rarely work at the transistor level and instead work with much larger blocks, like logic gates, and even larger components made up of logic gates, which we'll discuss in future episodes. And even if you are a professional computer programmer, it's not often that you think about how the logic that you are programming is actually implemented in the physical world by these teeny tiny components. We've also moved from thinking about raw electrical signals to our first rep- Okay. So that just gave you a little overview of what I said. And um, we're going to get into actually tracing the timing diagrams. And so now that we have a solid understanding of how these three gates work, I'm going to show you how we represent them with their waveforms. And so the input, so if we put a zero in here for input, that's going to trace everything right here. And we know that a NOT gate inverts that. So for the output right here, the output of zero should be one. Okay, now I'm gonna get into, what if we have a one here for input and a, that should be a zero for output. So if we have a one here for input, the output should be zero. And uh, when it just changes in between, so that changing in between is just here, and you can see they're opposite of each other. It's just a line to represent the state change from zero to one and from one to zero, this vertical line. Okay, now we're gonna get into the or. So if you guys remember, if one of the inputs is true, then the output is true. So if we have two inputs here, and let's say we start with zero, zero, not one of the inputs is true, so the output will be zero. So here I have zero and here I have zero. And so the output should be zero. And then right here, um, let's say we change one of the inputs to one. So if I have one and for the other one, I still have zero, then the output should be one since the top input's true. So I have one here and I have zero here. And so the output should be true. Now let's say, let's try the other combination where this one's gonna be zero this one's gonna be one. One of the inputs is true, so the output should be true. And if we look here, um, one's off, the other input's on, so the output's on. And then for last iteration, if both are on, so if I have a one here and a one here, so for both my inputs, we should definitely have an output of one since one of those is at least true. 
And so here you can see the two inputs are on, so the output should be on. And then you can just see here by the vertical lines, like I said before, this is where the state change is happening. So from zero to one or one to zero, that's what the vertical line means. Okay, now we're gonna get to the AND gate. The AND gate requires that both inputs must be true. And so you can see all from here, um, this one's zero, this one's zero right here, this one's one, this one's zero, this one is zero and this one's one. These inputs are not both one for any of this duration right here. They're zero, one, zero, and the other one is zero, zero, one. And so not both of them are one at the same time. So we should expect zero for the entire start of it. However, at the last iteration, we hit a one and a one for inputs. And so that should generate a one since both inputs are true, that will generate an output of one. So that's why we have the one here for a timing diagram. And so that's how a timing diagram works. It just tracks the inputs. And now we're going to get into the NAND and NOR gates. And so the fun, fancy thing about a NAND and a NOR is all you do is you add a NOT gate at the end of it. And so you guys can see right here when I'm talking about it, for the NAND, it's a NOT gate and just add an AND gate. Here's my NOT gate and here's my AND gate. So it makes the NAND. And then for my NOR gate, it's an OR and a NOT gate. So here's my NOT gate, here's my OR gate. And so this is the NOR gate. So the only difference is at the end, they have a bubble here and that bubble represents the NOT gate. And so that's what you guys will need to know because uh, you'll use those a lot uh, within your classes. So when you look at the actual diagrams, because you'll see these a lot, you'll have an X and a Y input and then your output, let's say is for the output. And so if we have zero, zero, and we have zero, one, one, zero, and one, one as our inputs, the NAND gate is like an AND gate. So if you guys remember for the AND gate, both inputs had to be true. And so if we take the opposite of the function for a NAND gate, because I'm gonna show you what a NAND gate looks like, we just invert that output. So the actual output we should get for the NAND gate is one, 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 zero. And so uh, this one right here, this is the actual NAND, where the one right over here was the AND gate, the other one's the NAND gate. So the NAND gate just does the opposite of the output for the AND gate, because the NAND is just the NOT of the AND gate. Okay. Now I'm gonna get into the NOR gate. And so for a NOR gate, I'm gonna show the output of the OR gate and the output of the NOR gate. And so for inputs, we're gonna have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And for an OR gate, uh, one of the inputs has to be true in order for the output to be true. And so if you look here, that's the original output for an OR gate. The NOR gate just takes the opposite since there's a NOT gate added to it. And so that's what a NOR gate will do. And so if you just look, that's the only difference between the two is the NOR gate just flips the output of the OR gate and the NAND gate flips the output of the AND gate. So it's pretty simple. And now I'm gonna get into a logic gate circuit shown on a breadboard. And so how you can implement this actually in real life and see the result. And so here's an image I have, and I'm gonna show you how a NOT gate works. And so um, you guys will often have to deal with while breadboarding, these little chips here, they're called IC chips. So what IC chips are, label it here, is IC chip and IC stands for integrated circuit. And so those gates are happening within this chip here. And so um, within our chip, we have to have 
uh, power supply. So that's usually called VCC. And then there's a ground. And that's usually the bottom right pin. And usually there's about seven pins on each side. So I'm going to draw it right here on the actual chip for you guys. So there's one connected to the voltage source. Then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven pins for other inputs you have up here. One has to be connected to voltage. The other six will have the gates within them. Then you're going to have seven pins on the bottom. So one, two, three, four, five. Oh, let me distribute that better. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so we have seven pins on the bottom row. And one of those pins is connected to ground. So the other six pins are used for the gates. And so the cool thing of the IC chip is I'm going to show you how the integrated circuit is actually embedded within this chip. And so um, what I want to do is I'm going to make it larger for you guys just for a better understanding of how it works, because this is really important for 201. So I'm going to make a larger representation. And I'm going to have my seven pins. So here's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then seven pins on the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the top left pin is connected to voltage. So we have VCC. And the bottom right is connected to ground. And what happens for these others is that you'll see in the data sheet, but they'll have gates within them. So here, they'll have the not gate. And so then it goes up here to this. So this is an input right here. So I'm going to represent it with an I. And the other one's going to be the output. So the output's going to occur right here. And then they're going to have another gate. So they're just going to have these gates going through because this is um, an integrated circuit, so the gates are within it. And then they're going to have another logic gate right through here. So they're going to do that. And then they're going to have a logic gates on the other side too as well. So within this circuit, you guys are able to see that there are six not gates that can be built within it due to the number of pins we have. And so that's the one cool thing is if you look at all this, you can have an input right here, and then you can have an output right here. Then you can have an input here. You can have an output here. And then on the bottom row, you can have your output, your input, and then your output, your input, and then your output and your input. And so that's the nice part of the integrated circuit is that within the integrated circuit, there are the logic gates. So that's how it's integrated. And so they have specific numbers, each of these IC chips. So you'll see in the data sheet um, on top of these, I have an example. So I'm gonna take you out of the presentation mode and actually show you. They're really small um, when I had them for 201. So you got to be careful, but they look something like this. So let me exit the presentation mode and stop my share. And so they're really tiny. They look about like this. So let me turn off my background. And it, this is what an IC chip looks like. And so if you guys want to see, and basically you can notice this one actually has eight pins on each side. So it has 16, so it has a little more, but the majority have 14. And on top here, there should be the Texas Instruments. Let me get one that's better so you can actually see the number on it. Okay, what I did on this one is I marked it, but there should be a specific number on top. It's usually in white, and I just put a piece of tape over it to make it larger. And this one says 7410. And you go on the data sheets for these. And let me show you guys how to actually navigate that. And so for the data sheets, what you do is I found out my number. So I'm going to search up Texas Instruments. And then it was 7410. Then search up data sheet PDF. And when I do that, it looks like my first result. I have here is 
what I'm looking is when I go on these data sheets, I'm trying to find, okay, which one matches up with mine. And I noticed right here, I had, it looks like there's a 7410 um, that the LS just stands for like low speed or it can be high speed. So this is probably what I'm predicting. And I'm looking at all these. And when I looked at my chip, I wanna make sure it had seven pins on each side for this one. And so I look and that looks correct because the grounds in the bottom right, the voltage is in the upper left. And my inputs are going to be this A and B here. Um, and it looks like my out and also this C. Those are my inputs. And then my output, they usually have the outputs towards the end of the alphabet. So like Ys. So your inputs are usually at the beginning of the alphabet. So 1A, 1B, and 1C. And your output for those so I'm going to just have a circle here represent whatever gate it is. And your output's going to be 1Y. My next set would be 2A, 2B, 2C. So those would all be interconnected here. And then you'd have your logic gate, and the output would be 2Y. And then here's your other logic gate over here. You have 3C, 3B, and 3A. Then you have a gate, and it's connected to the output 3Y. So your inputs start at the beginning of the alphabet and your outputs are at the end of the alphabet. And so then that's how you all have your chip connected. However, you have to make sure to verify these on each of the data sheets because you can see right below, if you messed up the number of 5410, you can tell the power is in the center and the grounds in the center. And um, that can cause an error because your power should actually be in the top left and the ground. So nothing might be happening down here. So you got to be careful with those data sheets. Also, you'll notice this little niche in your um, actual pins. And I have one right here. So let me stop share, see if I can show you guys. There's that little niche there that represents that one side. So you guys can coordinate and make sure you choose the proper end. So right here for the niche, that shows you at the one end of the chip. So that will be the side with the power and 1A. So you can make sure to choose the correct side. And now I'm going to talk about the rest. So after you guys find that data sheet, then uh, we're going to get a little into a simulation so you guys can actually try it for yourselves. So I'm going to drop this link in the chat just to have a little um, practice with it and if you guys want to practice as well and I'm going to just run you guys through the basic examples I went over today in class for the simulator uh, circuit verse I used actually within my class I like it because of its simplicity and so I'm going to show you a basic or gate and then I'll talk about uh, the project we're doing next week and then I'll let you guys go so for my or gate I have two inputs because um, if you guys remember, I'm going to show you how an OR gate works. You have your inputs and then there's an OR gate and then there's an output. So your input could be like X and Y and your output could be F. Let's just call it that. And so I chose my two inputs here. And for uh, my gate, I click on gates and I click here to drag the OR gate and I connect my signals to it. So I have zero, zero, and then for my output here, I have, I want it to record the value. And so it makes sense that it's giving me a zero here. And the reason why is if we look back at the truth table for an OR gate, what it gives me for the representation is for my inputs, when I have zero, zero, my output should be zero. When I have zero, one, my output should be one. When I have one, zero, my output should be one. And when I have one, one, my output should be one. And if I run through all these four, I have zero, zero here, so my output should be zero. I have zero, one, so my output should be one. I see that right now. When I have one, zero, my output should be, oh, that's weird, is it? Oh yeah, it's not connected, that's why. When I have one, zero, it's one. And when I have one, one, it's one. And so that's nice just to see and verify the truth table works and my OR gate combination works. So you guys can get all what you want here, all the certain combinations. 
in order to make your circuit. So I like circuit first just because of its simplicity. You can do gates on here. So you can do the rest of the gates. They have exclusive or exclusive um, nor. They have the NAND gates. They have nor gates. They have nots. They have or. And they have AND gates. And then for decoders here, uh, they have multiplexers. You'll learn this in 301. I don't recall if they touch on it too much, and maybe just very vaguely in 201. And then they also have uh, your prior priority encoders, and then uh, they have decoders as well. And then they also have a clock if you need to put a clock as an input, and um, you can also annotate on it. So I like doing this just to verify my circuit works before I implement it on the breadboard. And that's how you're able to get through and do all of your digital logic. And so I'm gonna now go back to the PowerPoint and I'm gonna show you guys what we're gonna be doing in the next coming weeks. And so next week, we're gonna be doing our first project. We'll be meeting at actually 3 p.m., not 4 p.m. due to the scheduling conflicts. Uh, I have a class at four, so sorry. Um, so at 3 p.m. next week, we're going to go over the four digit seven segment display. If you guys are on EE-186, those kits should include everything you need. If you um, don't have that kit, don't worry because you can use Tinkercad. So if you don't have anything, uh, don't worry, you're totally fine here. And what's gonna be uh, used for this project is a seven segment display. So right here I have my display, you can see by the numbers. And we're going to have 11 wires here. So you can see the wires going to and from this display to the Arduino. And uh, wires for the push button. So we're going to need a push button in addition to those uh, wires. And we're going to have uh, one wire left as spare if you want decimal points on your seven segment display. And so you're going to be using an Arduino Uno uh, with the cable. And we're going to program the Uno, so the microcontroller to display uh, the specific numbers for on this um, counter. And so that's what we're gonna be doing next week for a project. And we'll be walking it through step-by-step. Step. We have a manual so you can reference that. And I'll be trying to show you my uh, actual camera and my setup with my breadboard and Arduino right next to it. And so that should conclude our presentation for today. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to stick around and I'm gonna stop the recording and thank you everyone for coming this week.